From the shores of Puget Sound, this is Greener Views, a unique media resource for information, education, consultation, and fun. Greener Views is a part of the Healthy Homecast Network and is brought to you exclusively by HealthyPainting.com and AmbrosiaDigitalMedia.com. Each episode will introduce and connect you with services, products, practices, organizations, and groups that focus on the health, happiness, safety, well-being, charity, and community of all. Find us on the web at www.greenerviews.net. And now, your host, Daryl Whalen. Good evening and welcome to episode 42 of Greener Views. I'm Daryl Whalen and I'm here with Randy Parcell, your audio engineer, and uh, Michael Schwartz, your video engineer. Joining us this evening is Nora Lenz from Raw School. Good evening. Greener Views is brought to you exclusively by HealthyPainting.com and AmbrosiaDigitalMedia.com and is part of the Healthy Homecast Network. If you'd like to advertise or be a sponsor or donate, please contact info at GreenerViews.net or call 206-650-4587. So generally how we start is we talk about how I know the guest, and I've been thinking about it over the last few days. I... I got part of the raw food quote unquote community about four and a half years ago. And uh, I started going to some of the, the gatherings. Most of them were out at uh, in Redmond at the time at Tom, oh, Tom and Susan's. Okay, and I, yeah. that's where I saw you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you had the uh, training that you put on at the uh, cooperative extension as part of the university. You did the class. I did classes at Discover U. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think okay. that was part of the, okay. ex, that was like a cooperative extension as part of the no, Washington No, I think they were River. separate. Oh, were they? Yeah. Okay. Well, I had that part of it wrong. But she did a great all-day, it was pretty much an all-day class, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I did uh, a few of those. It was about the whole raw thing, and uh, perhaps before we get the whole thing rolling here but, or over tonight, maybe I'll talk about how I had gotten into the, the raw food thing, but that's how we met, and... Uh, then uh, looking for support through the internet and through the Yahoo groups, and you facilitate one of those groups, and mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to get a lot of information through that. So uh, welcome and thank you for thank joining you. us this evening. And uh, let's do let's get right into it and do a little bit of raw food 101. Okay, sounds good. So uh, what is what is a raw food diet? Is it a diet or? Uh, it's a diet, but it's much bigger than diet, of course. Once you start discovering truths, the the lies that you've been told your whole life tend to unravel, and you figure out, you know, you start to figure out that a lot of what you've been taught mm. was really advertising and didn't have a lot to do with, you know, health. It had to do with propping up some industry or another, like the meat industry or the dairy industry or the junk food industry or the medical industry. So once you get all that propaganda, you know, out of your head and you got to fill, you got to figure out where the propaganda ends and the truth begins. And, and so once you start doing all that, it bleeds into other areas in your life and the world and, and you find out there's, you know, there's a lot to learn. So, and, um, to be successful, you really have to be prepared to make a shift in your life, um, away from, you know, sometimes away from your social circle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to find new friends that like to be healthy. Um, if your friends, if your current friends are partiers or whatever, it can, or if, you know, if you're in, in a marriage with a person who's interested in doing that kind of thing. So it, or even your profession. So it can, um, if you want to be healthy, you sometimes have to make some hard decisions and, and sometimes you have to make compromises too. So. So yeah, it's much more than diet. It's it's very much a lifestyle. Great. So uh, so, do you want to talk a little bit about the base? There's a lot of stuff that I've read and things that that I know. And the thing about propaganda and controversy is something that's included in that, just like everything in life. I mean, isn't the idea that calling the stuff about the corporations and stuff trying to hold us 
of propaganda. Isn't that itself propaganda? I mean, who really knows? Um, but uh, what is your uh, thoughts or your knowledge or your feelings about the, the history of raw food in general? Yeah, there are a lot of controversial issues, and I think it um, stems from what I just mentioned. You don't, It's hard to separate um, the propaganda from the truth, and so what people bring, the baggage that people bring along with them when they go raw um, determines what they accept and what they follow and what they preach to other people. And so it, it can be tough for newbies to, to sort it all out. And um, people like quick fixes, and that's what they've been told to expect. That's what they've been taught. If you have a symptom, you have to shut you have to shut that thing down. You know, don't let it express itself. And um, they expect quick results from their um, dietary changes too. They expect overnight, you know, improvement. And it doesn't happen quickly. It actually happens pretty slowly. And um, but people get quick results from drugs and herbs and and um, the remedies that people use and that's what they expect and and there are also lots of um, things that happen during transition that aren't pleasant sometimes and people don't understand why things they're making all these sacrifices and they're you know they've cleaned up their diet in a big way and they're still suffering and they don't understand that that's part of the process you know that all of that stored waste has to come out and when that happens there can be it can be unpleasant but it's temporary yeah and um so controversy enters that too because people start to see that possibly as deterioration instead of um healing instead of healing. transformation exactly yeah and so they look for answers and they end up going to doctors sometimes, and and that can really spell doom for because there aren't very many in the medical profession who know about nutrition. They just don't. They aren't taught those things. They're taught how to suppress symptoms, so it's hard to get accurate information. And that's one of the reasons why I started the the website. Yeah, no, it's amazing. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, so people that are often 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50, 60, 70 years old take on this new lifestyle and it's it's got all kinds of stuff for you emotionally, physically, spiritually and everything doing it to you and it's like it's 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 quite overwhelming and hard to understand. And just the age difference um determines a, I mean just the age of the transitioner determines a lot of their experience. So, you know, sometimes 25-year-olds will say, "Oh, I didn't have any, you know, yeah. any of that transitional difficulty at all. I just decided I was going to go raw and I did it." Well, when you're 25, you still got a lot of your original vitality. You can eat whatever you want yeah. to and still be healthy. I mean, I did when I was 25, and a lot of people do. Um, but when you, you know, wait 20 more years, and then have you, a bunch of garbage in your body, yeah, and then you got a lot of cleaning out to do, and you've got a lot of withdrawal, yeah. you know, cr cravings to deal with, and all that stuff, and it can be extremely difficult. I mean, and if you wait later, 55, 60, 70, you know. It can it can really be difficult. It can be impossible to be completely pure. Yeah. You know, you you almost have to make you know allowances for somebody who's been eating garbage for sixty or seventy years. Yeah, no, so. it's a pretty intense thing. Uh, yeah, if you've eat, for if you're fifty years old and you've been eating nothing but hamburgers and Coca Cola and drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes, and then you go on this complete pure raw diet and like just the craziest things like start to happen to your body and stuff yeah. and everybody tells us that you're wrong and everything but but they don't tell you that you're so wrong about all that other garbage that you've been putting into your system for right. like ever it's pretty crazy but that's and you don't even have to i mean you don't even it doesn't even have to be that extreme even yeah. if you're following a so-called healthy diet i was uh cooked vegan for 13 years i thought it was i was pretty fanatical i didn't yeah. eat in restaurants very much i mean you know couple times a month maybe because I wanted my food to be prepared by me I wanted to know what was in it and 
I made wholesome food, but I still had a lot of detox to do when I when I finally went raw because those for, those foods in the cooked vegan diet aren't all they're cracked up to be. Oh, no, some of them are quite terrible. As a matter of yeah. fact, for myself, now I'm coming up on two weeks from now, it'll be one whole year that I've been 100% vegan, but I've really... Uh, admittedly i'm i'm <laughs> admittedly saying that i've i've just had really really a challenge with it i've i've gone through up to two two and a half months being 100 percent raw and uh but the transition in between i mean i spent the majority of my life as you know basically a, a drinker and a drug taker and and mm -hmm. a cigarette smoker and just on a horrible diet raised by a family that lives lives in ohio and they you know, even to this day, part of my family raises animals and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just completely horrible, you know, f family members all across the board having heart attacks and stuff in their 50s and and bypasses and everything. And uh, it, it's it's it, it's just it's it's really heartbreaking. And I just don't believe that we're meant to live like that and to eat like that and everything. Mm -hmm. But it, it's it's really, really a, it's really, really a challenge. I know I've talked to you a number of times over the last four or five years, and you've offered a tremendous amount of support. And I haven't quite been able to get it yet, but uh, I've seen some some uh, you know momentary glimpses of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the transformation that you know you talk about people sometimes needing to wait a you know a tremendous long you know amount of time, especially at my age. I'm going to be 52, and uh, you know. You can't expect to just trans transition or transform or to turn over a lot new leaf in a few months. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, problems stem from people not realizing how hard it is. Yeah. Just, you know, they listen to these very young people who go raw and then they just start cheerleading for it. And, and, and the people coming in who are 40 or 50 years old, they're like, why is it so hard for me? What's wrong with me? Well, there's nothing wrong with people who have trouble transitioning. It's because it's just a really difficult thing to do. I, I once heard it described as cooked food addiction as a sticky web, and that's what it is, because it's just so difficult to extricate yourself from that whole eating for entertainment and mm. Um, just mindlessly shoving food in your mouth for no good reason, for just because somebody and else is doing and right. Suppressing stuff. You're bored, yeah, or yeah. you're in some social situation, and all that stuff. It's abnormal. It's unnatural. It's disease causing. Yeah. But nobody in our culture is giving us support to get away from it. No, it's a, it's, it's a the fact opposite. That complete opposite. Right. Is it? Do you do you believe it's possible that uh, that that it can be? literally a, like a stamp on our dna because our parents and our grandparents and and their grandparents had these i mean what i know is my my you know my grandparents and everything were so big and everything and just ate gravy and potatoes and meat mm -hmm. and you know vegetables had meat in it and the vegetables were cooked down to like having like zero nutrition and mm -hmm. and sodas and chocolate milk and everything and that was you know my grandmothers and grandfathers that were born in the 1800s mm -hmm. and and that's how they ate and stuff and then my parents and to this day i mean my mom is 72 years old and she told me that you know i mean i've seen she came out to seattle not that long ago and we couldn't even walk downtown because she couldn't walk down the street and and she says that she can't even walk across the street now and everything and mm -hmm. and uh we've had people on our show that were maybe not 72 but relatively close but were incredibly vibrant because of their you know their lifestyle i'm not mm -hmm. saying that they were all raw foodists but i know that they were being much more mindful of their diet and their exercise and and the things that they were doing in their life as activities and mm -hmm. stuff and uh do you think that it's possible that it can be a stamp on our dna well i have read that the, that dna can be changed over time as a consequence of the lifestyle choices that people make from you know one generation to the next but i don't as far as having difficulty transitioning it's, it would be nice to think that there's something that really stops it from happening, something you could blame, but it's just that it's um, it just runs so deep in our lives all the way back yeah. to childhood, eating those foods and being taught that those foods were good, sometimes being forced to eat those oh, foods. Sure. I know that I wasn't yeah. allowed to leave the table, table. without, <laughs> you know, cleaning the plate and all of that stuff. Yeah. And um, 
and you know comforting ourselves mm. and having our parents encor- encourage us to comfort ourselves and and numb our emotions with food and um just the social structures that are built around food, the mm. dinner parties and the banquets and all of those special events that we had in our lives growing up, all centered around food and really junky food, really bad food. I mean, you know, we had we used to have this sit down dinner every year with, you know, the campfire girls and our dads, you know, and we'd all just sit down around the table and they would serve this just horrible hmm. meal that yeah. I wouldn't feed to my dog, literally. You know, you know, now, they, you know, your parents probably to some degree really did love you and wanted you to have a good life. But at the same time that they were feeding you yeah, and like encouraging you to eat that poison. They just didn't know. Yeah, they didn't know. There was a woman that I heard just uh, recently and I'm really bad with memory and names, but she's. I believe she's in her 60s or 70s, and she still runs all the time. And she has, it's almost 100% raw food diet. And she talked about the, her her meals, like, on a regular basis, on a regular day. And it was the most incredibly healthy-sounding thing, but it didn't sound like it was an excessive amount. It was, like, just, like, the right amount and everything. And, you know, there's a, there's a part of, uh, I think, especially in America, we have this idea about, being so excessive and more and, you know, bigger and more is better. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and the truth of the matter is, you know, they give us these ideas that, you know, we're really meant to have more calories than we really can, that our body can do just great on. And, and the same, the thing with the protein and the calcium more, and more, and more. And, and, uh, that's part of that mental type of a yeah. thing that we get. As it turns out, less is better when yeah. it comes to food and, and the human body, when it gets clean, actually has much, much lower requirements for nutrients and calories than people think. Yeah. So the key is um, getting clean so that your digestive system is actually making use of everything that you eat. So, And once that happens, everything that you eat gets used and you just don't eat very much. And that's that's another difficult stage that people come to when they're after they go raw. Some people do, you know, not everybody wants to go all the way to the the brass ring, you know, like I would like to. But um, but if you do, if you do want to go all the way to experiencing real hunger and only eating in response to hunger and getting rid of all of that other, you know, unnecessary, superfluous eating, um, and enjoy the absolute highest level of health that you can have, then you have to only you have to at some point you have to only give your body what it needs. Yeah, and a society. So what do you? So what are your thoughts or your knowledge about the the whole idea about human beings being uh, meat eaters versus vegetarians or vegans? Right. Well, the prevailing you know opinion among the health profession is that human beings are omnivores, and it always astounds me to see um, how practically unanimous that idea is among so-called health professionals um, because it's so blatantly obvious obvious that it's that's not the case we're not omnivores I mean if you look look at a raccoon who's a true omnivore a dog is an omnivore um, dogs are a bit on the end of the um, they're actually what's called a facultative carnivore, which differs very little from an omnivore, um, because that's always a point that people like to argue, are dogs omnivores or carnivores? Well, they're kind of in between, actually. Um, But if you look at like a bear, a bear is an omnivore. They eat berries, they eat fish, they eat, you know, grubs and insects and humans or whatever they can get their paws on, you know. And all you have to do is look at their teeth. You look at their intestines. That's not carnivore. That's omnivore. That's omnivore. Yeah, oh, okay. bears are om- omnivores for oh, sure. Okay. They they eat lots of berries. Eat lots of plant matter. Um, but they're probably a little more on the carnivorous scale than some other omnivores. You know, it's it's not black and white. There's a range oh, okay. for every species. But human beings are most assuredly frugivores. We're fruit eaters. Yeah, and we know that unequivocally because we can see there's no wild humans left in the world or very few um 
that haven't been influenced by civilization that we can look at, but we can find the species that we most resemble physiologically, and we can study what they do. And that hap the species that we most resemble happens to be the bonobo. Um, it's a, a type of chimpanzee, but it's not a chimpanzee. I don't know. And they pretty much just eat right. fruit, right? Yeah, they just eat yeah. fruit. Um, they do eat some tender greens, and they probably, you know, that maybe 2% of yeah. what they eat is insect matter yeah. and maybe some roots and grubs and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but they prefer fruit. They eat mostly fruit. If you just watch them, it's it's there's so much to be learned. People do actually observe bonobos, but they're more interested in their other behaviors, like their hunting behaviors, their reproductive behaviors, mm. and that all that sort of thing. I'm always when I listen to those documentaries and I have read a couple books, I'm always watching for the food thing. You know, I'm always wanting to hear some cue. And if you listen really carefully, you can hear it. You know, they're always talking about um, bonobos, you know, their food preferences, but they don't really linger on it. They don't think that there's any valuable information to be had there. And I mean, little do these researchers know that what those uh, bonobos are eating just has huge yeah. implications for our species. I mean, if we would, if, if they would just watch that, you know, watch their food choices and tell us, Hey, these animals are really like us. They're exactly like us on the inside, almost exactly like us on the inside. And they're eating only fruit. How how is that even possible? I mean, I remember thinking 15 years ago somebody mentioned that they had met some fruitarians in in Hawaii and I was like, I was vegan at the time. And I was like, where do they get their calcium? Where do they get the protein? Where do they get their blah blah blah, you know? Um, but I mean, there's a species that yeah. you know, they have no nutritional intellectual information in their heads and they're choosing their foods yeah. only on the basis of their senses of their instinct right how yeah, can yeah. how can they manage so and our instinct is being manipulated by society and telling us that like breakfast is supposed to be bacon and eggs and and scrambled eggs and like hash browns with like gravy on it i mean that's you know, if you look back into like history, into the reality of history before there was any kind of technological advances and stuff, and that stuff was like not even something that even existed. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, I mean, they're always, we're always disguising food so that we can sneak them past the taste. But, you know, like pasta, everybody loves pasta, everybody loves cereal. Well, if you tried to eat that kind of, eat that stuff in the raw state, I mean, you'd never yeah. be able to get it past your throat yeah, yeah, you know yeah. um so they put lots of sugar on it and lots yeah. of flavorings and they even put flavorings on meat to make it taste like fruit like uh, pineapple, i was just gonna say that's that's chicken, my favorite thing chicken. that i hear about the idea that people that's you know this you know it's generally people that are uh you know big and macho that talk about you know steak and everything but you rarely ever see them eating rare or raw and you rarely ever see them they say that if we were truly carnivores that when we saw an animal down the, going down the street, we would pounce on it, rip its neck off, drink its blood, and we'd be done. That's what carnivores do. Right, and that would not be repulsive. But we never. To us we've got to all. cut it up into certain sizes, and we've got to cook it, and we've got to put um, barbecue sauce, barbecue on sauce, it. and spices and stuff. And, yeah. and we, if if we don't put all that stuff, we marinate it and stuff, and it's generally all all uh, plant like base type stuff. So. You and know. we only want the tender pieces of meat. Carnivores yeah. don't just pick off no, like the no, prime rib. Rip right through the neck and yeah, the, the, the bones, heart, and right the, the bones organs, and, yeah. the every the fur. Even I mean, what they can't get, you know. Yeah. For being so macho, meat eaters were pretty wimpy about it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. It's very obvious. So, um, uh, what about uh, let's see? Oh, so what do you think is the big? rise in the stuff like uh, well veganism of course and raw food is becoming much bigger and bigger you hear well, about with, it with veganism i think um i think it's more of a moral thing people are recognizing that the animal agriculture industry is is really ugly and um it's it's just getting uglier um it's not getting better um it's not getting you know it's just not getting kinder to the animals. They're not making 
much headway as far as making improvements the to the animals because it's just getting bigger <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. meats you know, people are demanding more cheap meat and yeah, yeah, yeah. so so the vegan rise is probably moral i with the rise of raw food i think it has more to do with people recognizing that medicine has failed it's failed yeah. to to keep us healthy and it's not happening nearly fast enough because when you start to discover how abjectly medicine has failed to instruct us on how to stay healthy then you you know you wonder why it isn't obvious to everybody and but um and people you know they usually medicine will put people through the ringer and and they'll try drugs and they'll try surgeries and then they'll jump into alternative medicine and they find out that that doesn't work and mm. and then you know eventually people some people not everybody by any means um discover that they have more power than they thought they had mm. and they try to and they start to take their power back and that's what that's what I like to do I like to empower people to realize they don't have to give the I mean the the factors that determine whether people get sick are all within our power. I mean, we decide how much we sleep and what kind of foods we eat and how much exercise we get and and all of that. Um, nobody else can do that for us. And those are the things that, that, that determine whether or not we're going to get sick. So I think that's what's motivating people. And there's more and more doctors, like regular medical doctors that are coming out, uh, um, you know, I mean, some of them are more rooted towards the veganism, but they talk mm -hmm. about live and whole and raw plant foods and everything. And these are people that were working in like major uh, medical facilities and stuff. And it's I think that there's a big shift. I mean, I don't know how big it is and stuff. I don't know if there are those people really looked at as being like wackos and stuff. And the idea I mean, my my mother is on so many medications yeah. and she has she's under this idea that that's that's what she needs to do and how she needs to be in order to like live and survive. Mm -hmm. Not even the idea that there's like an alternative that, I mean, I know personally people in the short period of time that I've been involved in this that have gone from being on 12 to 15 different kinds of medications on a regular basis. And after a few short, you know, months or even like literally right. months have gone down to like, you know, several to zero on the medications. Right. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Are those like some kind of wackos or something? Or... I know. The transformations are just amazing. I mean, I know myself. I Like I said, the longest I've ever gone is two and a half months, 100% raw. And I feel a transformation within like a week or two as far as like my clarity and my vibrancy and stuff. But I'm a hardcore addict, and I do have my challenges and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I'm not giving up the fight yet. But but anyhow, that's just what my thought is about that. Um, so um, so why don't you talk about uh, transition in general? Why don't you talk about your uh, your getting into raw and when that happened, and talk about what that was like and your transition and what what it's like now? Okay. Um, well, about. In about 1987, I read a book called um, Diet for a New America, and that led to my reading of another book called Fit for Life, which is still a great book, by the way. I still recommend that book to a lot of people who are starting from the standard American lifestyle. Um, and so I decided to go vegetarian, and then I went vegan, and I was vegan for 13 years, and... I was following those doctors that you were referring to, like Esselstein, I guess he's kind of a new one, and Ornish, uh, McDougall, um, Michael Clapper, those doctors who are really, um, and there is a shift among them, um, because I recall being at a, a lecture by Dr. McDougall, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, and somebody in the audience asked him about eating a raw food diet. And I didn't know anything about it at the time, mm. but it was his answer was really interesting. He says, you can't do it. You just get too hungry. Well, I really I haven't heard him talk on the subject lately, but I really think that he has to have changed his mind about that with so many people going 100 percent raw and discovering that what you feel when you eat only raw food might 
you know, it might fit the, the criteria of what we think is hunger, but it's not real hunger. And I think he probably has figured that out by now. But um, so I followed Dr. McDougall's plan for a long time. It's very um, starch based. It's um, it's it's not a very healthy diet. I like I said, I had a lot of detoxing to do, even though I thought I was healthy. It's whole it's, you know, whole grains. I didn't eat a lot of refined grains and that sort of thing. And I certainly wasn't eating animal products, but, um, but you can still manage to get a lot of garbage into a cooked vegan mm. diet, even if it's based on whole grains and, and cooked vegetables, which mine was with, you know, a little fruit thrown, thrown in here and there. But, um, about 12 years ago, I read a book called nature's first law. And before that, I was starting to hear things about the raw food diet and that, um, you know, if a person ever gets sick, what you should do is go raw. You know, you should go raw and your body will heal itself. I, I just picked that up along the way. And so I had this idea that I would just follow this marginally healthy cooked vegan diet. And then if I ever got sick, I would um, adopt a raw food diet. Well, when I read this book, I realized um, that people were going raw to forestall disease and to to increase their 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 positive experience right now not it really didn't have anything to do with living longer it had to do with how they felt right now and how much energy energy they had and how they looked and how they felt and i was working out five or six i was teaching fitness classes five or six times a week and I was still 50 pounds overweight and I was following what I thought was a really healthy diet. Mm. So I, you know, there were definitely some, um, some things that I wanted to achieve. And when I read that book, it's very militant, by the way, it's a, it's not pretty a bad hardcore. book. Yeah. yeah it's I have it's it. pretty hardcore. Um, I think it's a lot of fun to read. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it gave me the kick that I needed yeah. um, because it was, you know, it was so uncompromising and, you know, and, ends every chapter with cooked food is poison, which isn't necessarily true, but I like that black and white thing. I, I it really isn't necessarily that. untrue either. <laughs> right. I was pretty self-disciplined. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it can go either way, but I was pretty self-disciplined when I started. So, um, cause I'd already gotten used to the idea of taking food with me because there wasn't going to be anything at the place where I was going that I could eat as a vegan. So, and being treated differently and having to defend my diet and ask, you know, having people ask about it and all that, all of that stuff and preparing food at home, um, all of that was already in place for me. I didn't just go grab, you know, a burger when I was hungry or whatever, all of that preparation and thinking behind what I ate was already there. And that's a hard shift for people to make. So I kind of had a head start there. Um, and I also met some people early in my transition that sort of nudged me into the path of natural hygiene, which is more of a purist approach. And it's, it's very much centered on getting out of the way of your body and letting your body heal itself. Mm. Um, but anyway, once I realized that other people were, were going raw, um, I decided I would feel left behind if I didn't just jump in. So I did, and I went, I liked the black and white thing. I, I made cooking sort of a prohibition in my life right away. Um, for a few weeks, I ate popcorn and baked potatoes. And then after three weeks, I decided that I didn't need those anymore <laughs> either. Only three weeks, right? Yeah. Now I recommend that people go a lot slower than I did mm. because... Um, I think the only way that I managed to not backslide is because I had this very strong, powerful influence of other people in my life who were following, who were way ahead of me. One person especially who was, who became my mentor and he had already been raw 12 years when we met. And so he was, he was very experienced. He knew what I should expect in the way of transitional difficulties and detox and all of that and every time something came up i talked to him and he was like well here's what's happening you know this he would explain the mechanism and and it just helped so much and knowing how much that helped is what motivated me later to you know put out my shingle as a raw food coach because it just i saw so many people failing uh, because they didn't have the information they needed to stay on track. 
because it's it can be very scary when you don't understand your symptoms when you don't understand why they're happening mm. so yeah you know there's so much here and this is a, a subject that's very near and dear to me on a lot of different levels and at one time i actually was considering doing a raw food podcast so like every week we'd be talking about it um so unfortunately we're not going to be able to get into everything that i want to talk to her we'd be here for like hours because mm -hmm. i know i could chat with you at that level um, I did have a, a question, and then I wanted to get a little bit into the raw school thing. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what's your thoughts about, you know, one thing I hear when you talk to people, uh, there's a lot of different ideas about the, you know, the, the fully raw thing versus the partially raw thing versus some cooked food. What's, what's your thoughts about that? It's so individual. People really need to... Um need to have a, a plan that takes their lifestyle and their preferences and their past addictions and habits and all of that and their financial situation and their living mm. can living situation with their family and all of that all of those things have to be taken into account it's a hundred being a hundred percent raw is not something that everybody can do yeah if you have to cook for a family if you know i've i've had people from other countries contact me who are young and still living with their parents because they're you know financially they're in difficulties and their parents are absolutely opposed to mm -hmm. i mean and they have no car they can't get their food they're dependent on and so it's it it can be very difficult and um not all cooked food is as bad as, I mean, there's a huge spectrum. You can yeah. eat really, really bad yeah. cooked food and you can eat cooked food yeah. that's actually not bad for you at all. And the the cooked food that's that's not bad for you can be very helpful in getting you to that place where you could eat all raw. So I think the way I did it was a mistake. Um, you know, I can't go back and change anything. If I had it to do over again with the information and the knowledge that I have now, I would go slower. I would keep some of those, um, you know, fairly innocuous cooked foods in my diet for a while. And and what I did is I ended up just eating lots of nuts and eating a, a lot of complicated um, fatty raw foods. And that can have worse consequences than if you keep simple, you know, cooked veggies or mm. cooked potatoes or, you know, things like that in your diet. Um, so... It, it's just so individual. If somebody wants to be 50% raw, and there's just so many different ways that you can approach it. You can be all raw until lunch and then have a cooked lunch and cooked dinner. You can be all raw until dinner and then have a cooked dinner. Or um, you can have one raw day per week or one raw day per month. Or And then, you know, after you do one month, then the next month, do two raw days in the month. And and if that's too much, if you find the next day you just start binging on cooked food to make up for it, that's a signal to you that you went too far. And and you need to go back and go, okay, well, maybe I'll do a half a raw day a month or whatever. People can only do what they can do, and they need to uh, be able to forgive themselves. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a huge factor in this because people are always, um, there's just so much self-recrimination, like, why can't I do this? And so much guilt, and it's really not necessary. You got something, Michael? I have a question. Sure. What is a raw diet? Is it, do you eat raw hamburger meat, or I mean, I really, what I don't. Well, that that's a good question. Yeah. What about the raw? Uh, you know, the... what defines a raw? The raw food diet. Um, there's a raw the way, vegan the diet, and then there's a raw. Is... There's a raw diet that has. It, well, it's vegan. kind of there's there, it's yeah. kind of broken into two different camps. There's the raw animal product diet and it's called the paleo diet for the most part and but what we're talking about is the raw vegan diet and it's, so it's basically it's, whole live raw fruits and vegetables and nuts, nuts and, and seeds. seeds yeah that's it it's pretty much it yeah yeah so great well uh and then the one other thing is and then we're going to take a break uh so you were talking about you seem that seem to believe that the, the motivation for a lot of people I don't know if that's initially or all across the board but with the with the raw versus the vegan you seem to mention that the uh, it's not uncommon for vegan people to do it for other than themselves and they have uh, 
advocacy towards animals and maybe even potentially the environment and other things, but mm -hmm. you see that less so in the raw food movement. Is it possible to have both? And Oh, there is. You know, there are lots of people in the raw food movement who are concerned with animal welfare, and that's one of their motives. And when I first went raw, I was... I was really into the animal rights movement, uh, but I've sort of moved away from that in favor of um, health, because I really think that if everybody just focused on making themselves healthy, then the rest would would work out. You won't. You don't have to worry about you know being militantly vegan, if you're healthy and vegan and making all the right choices for yourself. If everybody did that, then everything would it would just work out. So and so you, and it and it's really it's it's difficult to to twist people's arms about yeah giving up animal products or giving up cooked food or whatever they really have to find yeah. it for themselves. Well, being militant about anything is a bad thing, not yeah. necessarily a good thing. But I think if you were inherently having a uh, a non-animal diet and uh, your life had started to change, you'd, you'd likely your your general joy and your and your passion would turn into a compassion that would automatically lend itself to that type of life anyhow is that kind of what you're saying yeah you really do change on the inside yeah. your emotions change your mind gets clearer and yeah fair enough so well listen we're going to take a break and uh we'll be right back uh, with more of episode 42 of green reviews and we're here with nora lens from raw school you are listening to greener views me to the earth which connects me to people who connect me to myself more honestly in gravity connects me to the crust which connects to the leaves on the trees that make it possible to breathe came to rest on the minefield blessed with naive mind shield like a helmet they would tell us that we don't know how we feel or how to connect with other people on the planet. Oh, if we only knew the power in each blue disillusion little. In the vision of one resides all destroy the individual, for this is critical. The self ain't everything, has to grasp, to cling, to mask material vastly shipwrecked beings. At last, release the greed amassed with capitalist tasks and contact. The mass communication is all we have in dwindling fast. Okay, welcome back. We're here on episode 42 of Green Reviews. And joining us, Nora Lenz from Raw School. And uh, while well, there's a lot of stuff, like we were talking at the break, that we could probably turn this into a at least a four-part or uh, without too much of an effort. So uh, let's get into uh, what, what you're doing with the Raw School. Why don't you give us to start off with a brief elevator pitch. What is Raw School? Raw School is a website that is devoted to espousing and educating people on the principles of natural hygiene, which is a philosophy of health that really, um, really involves... Um, allowing the body to heal itself and um, taking all of its cues from nature and it opposes the medical view of disease um, because it it there's basically one theory that or there's basically a theory that disease arises from one sole cause and that's toxemia that's um, the overloading of waste of the body with waste and uh, once you stop doing that, then the body cleanses itself and it heals itself in most cases. And um, I, I didn't see enough of natural hygiene being promoted when I first started getting into going raw. And I knew that that's the direction I wanted to go in. And I was learning so much from my mentor who had been living the natural hygiene lifestyle for 12 years that I, I just wanted... I wanted to tell everybody about it because it was it just seems like a miracle that mm. all you have to do is stop hurting yourself and your <laughs> body heals itself it's amazing and so i was very motivated and i thought should i you know I, i'm german so i have this thing about well i have to know 
everything about something before I start talking about it, right? And I just had to face that I wasn't going to know everything about this thing. And I, I had to accept that, um, there, I had to admit that there were some things I didn't know, but I still knew a lot and I knew enough to, um, to start writing about what I knew and to start publishing on a, on a website and, um, started a, the Yahoo group and, um, and, um, lots of people visit every day, I get like, I don't know, 150 new visitors every day. And wow. I'm pretty proud of that. I mean, it's not huge. It's not, you know, Sears.com or anything. But, Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's very helpful for a lot of people. I, I was very detailed when I, um, wrote about my own transition on the website um, because I wanted people to see what I went through and to relate their own experiences and their own symptoms to that and to understand, like I, I said something about in a couple, a couple years after I went raw, I thought I was over the worst of it, but I got, I had another healing crisis and I realized at that time that it was just my body had acquired that much more energy and vitality that it could go really deep and really start cleansing deeply and that it wasn't anything to worry about. It wasn't a sign that I was doing anything wrong. In fact, it can be a sign of doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And I wanted people to realize that. Um, so that, that was my motivating, um, inspiration there. So when did you start that? Uh, I think it was around 200, 2005 or 2000, about 2005, I guess. Yeah. Oh, okay. About f five years after I went raw. Yeah. So it started out as a blog and then you started to, uh, when did you start the, uh, the Yahoo group? Oh, like a year after I started the, yeah, the, the website. The Yahoo group is pretty amazing. I think it's, uh, the cool thing about it is it's an online uh, community. It's kind of like a chat board. But you get people's uh, insights and thoughts about it, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of it took a little, you know, adjusting because all those places, all of those um, resources have their own sort of environment, and I really wanted mine to be. I didn't want people backbiting or yeah, 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 yeah. or um, I didn't want it. I didn't want to have natural hygiene challenged. I wanted it to be a resource for people who were already who'd already done enough reading to understand that natural hygiene is valid. It's credible. Yeah. And, um, I don't mind, you know, defending it or whatever, or, ex or explaining it to people who sincerely want to understand it, but I didn't want medical people coming in. So I, I, I had to do a lot of banning initially, um, just to sort of weed people out. But the group that is left yeah. now pretty great is, group. is, is great. Yeah they understand it they live the lifestyle they feel isolated in their in their own lives and the group you know the the online group gives them a resource it makes them feel less alone in what they're doing and they can come on and talk about their experiences and other people will chime in and say yeah i've been through exactly the same thing and here's how i handled it and it's just very helpful to people and then another thing about the site is your information and your contact about your coaching. Do you want to talk about your coaching a little bit? How yeah. that works and how people get involved in that or find out about that? I've uh, Most of my um, coaching clients are have already gone raw. And they're, what they're trying to do, what they're attempting is to be low fat, um, high fruit, raw vegan. And that's a tough thing to do initially it really you need to move into it gradually and a lot of people discover that um eating lots of fat isn't the best way to go mm. fat's very hard for the body to digest even if it's raw even if it's nuts and seeds or whatever um so they they find out that that's bad and they try to stop immediately they try to go cold turkey and it's like anything else Shock cold to the turkey <laughs> is tough yeah. yeah and so they try to white knuckle and they they can't make it, they backslide. And maybe 90 to 95% of my clients in the last five years have been people who've gotten into that situation where they try to go cold turkey, do everything overnight, and they find themselves frequently backsliding and having a difficult time getting back on track. Um, and I, I help people move back a little bit 
so that they can go forward, so that they can keep smoothly going forward. It's like taking little steps instead of taking a big step and then finding you're not happy there. And then where do you go? You know, you can't go all the way back and you can't go forward either. So you want to avoid staying out of that situation of feeling trapped. And if you just take little tiny steps at every step of the way, if you happen to feel uncomfortable with that, you know, with what you're doing, like it's too much for you, you can just go back a little bit. You just, yeah. you know, ate what you ate last week or last month or whenever you made the last change. And it makes you feel better. And that actually allows you to keep moving forward. It's not backsliding to do that. You have to accept a little compromise. And that's what I like to do. I like to teach people how to accept compromise, what compromises to make. I look at their diets. I have them write down everything they eat for three or four days. And I look at what they're eating and I pick out the worst things and toss those things out and keep the best things. And people need help figuring that out. They, mm. There's a lot of misinformation <clears throat> out there in you know, the health world about what foods are healthy and which ones aren't. And people are misinformed. So um, they need somebody to to look at it objectively. And that's what I do. And uh, although uh, a, a significant amount of your clients are uh, more like towards the fruitarian type of a thing, you're certainly not opposed to taking on anybody as a client that's interested. I mean, you've helped me and I haven't been anywhere even close to that at a time, even when I was eating meat and stuff. I mean, you were being yeah, a absolutely. support. And the thing about your uh, the Yahoo group, is uh, you've you know you're continuously offering a tremendous amount of support for people wherever they're at, and it's uh, I'm really uh, inspired, and I'd really admire your really compassionate and loving approach to people wherever they're at, and the kind of information that you give out. So I do check that out. Yeah, I think there's a there's a big void in in the raw food world for accepting people even if they want to continue it can be very eating militant. animal products right yeah, 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 yeah. it's very judgmental yeah, yeah, can be very that. competitive and especially in the low fat vegan i mean uh, it's it's very competitive and this should not be competitive at all yeah. it should it's so individual it's such an alternative that's it's to like the to the norm in society and it's so outside the box that why would you create an atmosphere that people can even become even more I mean, by the way, I bought into that when I first found it. But I don't really have a whole lot of time to talk about my transition or my uh, introduction and my journey through the raw thing. But I, I, you know, I noticed that from the beginning, and I found myself beating up on myself because right. I wasn't able to go like fully raw immediately. Like, these people are like, you know, I went raw immediately, and I've been doing it for like 20 years now, and it's like, you know, I didn't. But there are certainly, by the way. You know, although that there's people that make it a little bit challenging or a little just you know disconcerting, there's uh, certainly like yourself and some other people that I know, and uh, we do have a pretty good community here in Seattle, and I know that there's yeah. other places, but there's certainly some beautiful, compassionate, helpful people, and so it's 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 really, I, I'd encourage people that are interested to uh, know that that it's not all militant and it's not all a contest and a right. competition like you had mentioned because i certainly right. did notice that mm -hmm. um so let's see well we don't have a lot of time because we've really been rolling along but how do people get in touch with you how do you people would you have uh let's see what about emails or phone numbers or websites i mean www.rawschool.com is yeah, one of them yeah that's that's the best way for people to contact me to just go to the website and email me through the website and i'd be happy to answer any questions great and is there any upcoming things that you've got in in uh, that you're working on that, that that we don't know about yet that's that you well can... i i launched a new website about a year ago um that attempts to apply the principles of natural hygiene to the care of cats and dogs. And so I'm doing a lot of work on that right now and helping people transition their animals and um, getting them the healthiest. And it's called nomorevetbills.com. And um, the, med it, the vet industry is even... And the more pet food in the industry. Dark. It's even more in the dark than the medical industry, and if that's possible. And the pet food industry is like, yeah. they're yeah. partners. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Well, I hope to get an opportunity to have a show just on that kind of stuff in the future if you'd be interested in yeah, it. Yeah, I'd love that. Great. Well, I think that's probably about it. Uh, 
we like to end it off with, uh, do you have any sage-like words of advice or words of wisdom or whatever that you want to leave us with? Um, well, the only thing that I can think of right now is that gradual change is best. Just, and forgive yourself and educate yourself and, um, understand, you know, try to just seek understanding about what's happening with your body instead of, instead of going right to fear right away. Cause that's the medical approach, making mm. people afraid. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Look at Nora. Oh, the only thing I could think of is like something completely awesome to say. Well, thank you oh. so much for that. <laughs> well, listen, we've been, uh, here, um, I guess I, uh, let's see, we've been listening to episode 42 of Green Interviews. And on behalf of uh, Michael and Randy and my, by myself, I say thank you. Uh, check out uh, greenreviews.net. Check out youtube.com slash greenreviews. Uh, please check out uh, ambrosiadigitalmedia.com. Uh, Green Reviews is part of the Healthy Homecast Network at healthyhomecast.com. Uh, if you have any questions, ideas for guests, suggestions for topics, if you'd like to sponsor a show or donate or advertise, call us at 206-650-4587. You can email us. That's info at greenreviews.net. So let's see. Next week is uh, episode 43. And uh, once again, I don't remember who the guest was, but you can find it on the website. And uh, that's it. See you next time. Thanks so much. Or hear you next time. Thank you for listening. Greener Views is part of the Healthy Homecast Network. Check out all their conscientious and sustainably focused podcast programs and businesses at healthyhomecast.com. Greener Views is created, developed, and produced by Daryl Whalen. Our audio engineer is Randy Parcell. Our video producer is Michael Schwartz of AmbrosiaDigitalMedia.com. Music for this episode was provided by SlapJazz.com, DanFagens.Bandcamp.com, and JDHobson.com. Your feedback is important. Please feel free to contact us with any comments or questions, including suggestions for guests and program topics. You can call us at 206-650-4587 or send a direct email to info at greenerviews.net. Be sure to check back often. New episodes coming soon.